Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Glad that you could join us for another segment. In this segment, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Joseph Schwab. He's Chief Orthopedic Spine Surgeon at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And he's joining us to talk about his presentation from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons 2020 meeting titled Artificial Intelligence in Orthopedics, Machine Learning, Natural Language, Processing, and Deep Learning. Welcome to the program, Dr. Schwab. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you very much. Well, give our listeners a bit of background about yourself, and then let's talk about uh, your role briefly uh, there at uh, Mass General. Oh, great. Uh, as you say, my, my name is Joe Schwab. I'm the chief of spine surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Uh, I'm also an orthopedic oncologist, and I'm the head of the artificial intelligence for our, for our department. Um, the, as as my, uh, my role as the head of AI uh, has also dovetailed with my research effort, and over the last four or five years, We've been using more and more aspects of artificial intelligence, specifically been using a lot of machine learning to help develop predictive models in orthopedics, usually pertaining to areas of my practice. Uh, for instance, we've, we've done models to predict survival in, in patients who have uh, bone metastases or, or spinal metastases. But we've also done models that, that predict uh, which of our patients will be on opiates six months after surgery, so after an elective spinal operation. Um, so it's really a variety of, of different predictive models. I think we've developed over 30 at this point. Um, and so part of our presentation was to talk about how we've developed these models and how we make sure these models are, um, are actually doing what we say that they're doing. So how do you uh, ensure that the models are doing what you expect of them? Well, one of the things that, that we do is there, there are various aspects of, of a model. Um, you you want to make sure that you're, you're, uh, most people are familiar with a C statistic or area under the curve. Um, and that, that is uh, sort of a, a baseline or entry level statistic for, for a model that is trying to predict something. <clears throat> but really, we go much further beyond that. Uh, one of the most important aspects of a model is, is what's called calibration. And what that means is that, that you're, you're able to assess your model uh, throughout the spectrum of predictions that the model's making. So, for instance, if I say that, that um, someone has a 10% chance of having this complication, um, and I can assess whether or not my prediction at 10% is, is accurate as it would be, say, if I, if I said it was 90%. So you look through the, the entire spectrum from 0 to 100%, where does your model uh, uh, fall off if it does fall off? There are models out there that are very good at their predictions for the first, say, 30%. But after that, it's not very accurate at all. And it's extremely important to understand that if you're going to use that in, in clinical practice. Now, this meeting was titled Artificial Intelligence in Orthopedics, Machine Learning, Natural Language Processing, and Deep Learning. Are all of those necessary and present working hand in hand at all times, no matter what the model, no matter what the projection, or are there bits and pieces of AI that are more suited to one aspect of a model than another? Yeah, absolutely. There, there are bits and pieces. Uh, and so as an example, the natural language processing algorithms that we've used, um, we, we have developed multiple uh, NLP models, but one of the models we developed was really to detect complications. So we've used it for quality assurance projects in our, in our department. Um, and just as an example, we, we, um, we looked at uh, dural tears, which is a complication after spinal operations. And the, the, the rate that we usually uh, tell patients is about 2 or 3% risk of a dural tear. But frankly, I always felt like my rate was a little bit higher than that. And I wondered why. And so we did this study. Um, and by looking at CPT codes, which is how people code uh, uh, for a procedure, the rate is about 2 or 3%. But when we looked at the actual operative notes and we used natural language processing to, to review the operative notes and then confirmed it by rereading the operative notes ourselves, mm -hmm. we found that the, the actual rate of dural tear injury was, was about 10%, just under 10%. But the thing is, they're not being coded. So if you use codes only to look for certain complications, you're often not going to find them. And we found the same thing with vascular injury to an anterior approach to the lumbar spine. So in this case, the NLP was used or developed in order to automate a QA um, a mechanism for our department. How has AI um, altered some of your most common procedures to um, facilitate better healing, less scarring, um, faster recovery? 
Well, it's interesting you say that because the the uh, it's a good question. And although we have developed multiple models, the the single greatest reason that AI is is not utilized more often than it, than it already is is that it's not it's not integrated into the workflow in most people's practices. And that's because most people use electronic medical records, which are great, but the electronic medical records are not that pliable. You know, there's usually a firewall of getting in and, and putting new algorithms in. And so that's a big push by the government. The, the NCI, for instance, has different programs to try to, to give people grant money to figure out ways to integrate a lot of these predictive models into the electronic medical record so that they're going to be part of people's workflow automatically. If you want to use the models that I've developed, for instance, or if I want to use my model, I have to leave my electronic uh, medical record, and then I'll go to our website, soar-ai.com, and then I can put in the parameters needed to run the model, and I'll get a probability back from our website. But that's not really in the workflow um, for most people, and it does add extra time. So I think the the uh, the real the real implementation of AI and the real use of AI will be once once it's fully integrated into the electronic health record, which is coming. Would you say that um, getting rid of the electronic health record as it exists today is what we would be striving for with the implementation of AI? I, I think no. I don't, wouldn't get rid of it, but I think it'll be it'll be different. And you know, so, in, a, in, a, in an ideal world, if you were uh, most most people are are used to having these these uh, devices in their homes, where you can you can ask the device to put on a certain uh, uh, program on the radio and it'll, it'll do it. Um, and the same kind of concept will probably come to practice. So, for instance, if you're seeing a patient uh, and you're talking to the patient about a particular procedure and you're talking to the patient about a particular risk, then the AI will be in the background, will then chime in and say, Mrs. Jones' risk of having said complication is X percent. And you know, then you may say, you know, well, your possibility of, of having a good outcome after a surgery, then the AI would ch- chime in, Mrs. Jones' uh, you know, probability of achieving uh, MCID would be 90% based on her parameters. So it'll be an augmented aspect of, of uh, the electronic health record. It'll be much more interactive. And, and uh, um, you know, you won't be turning your, your back to the patient as often because the AI will be interacting with you and the patient. Do you see the implementation of AI uh, going more toward uh, physicians being um, more efficient and facilitating better patient outcomes on their own by training with this AI and learning it? Or do you see it more efficient for staff that surround the, the physician and his activities? I mean, there's a lot of staff that have been done away with because more physicians are doing their own research and medical records input and analysis. Right. I, I, to way, the way I see it, um, we, in the future, uh, we won't even talk about AI. So I, I think that the interaction of AI will just become so natural that we won't speak about it. If you remember, you know, there was a time when none of us used computers. Mm-hmm. And so you might, you might be giving a, a talk at your office and you might say, well, I ran this on my uh, Excel, my Microsoft Excel, you know, on my, on my uh, desktop computer, you know, but nobody would say that now because it doesn't really matter. That's just part of what, what you do. And I think that's what, what, how AI is going to be. Nobody's going to be asking about AI or machine learning. It'll just be inherent in, in the way we do things. Is there a, a web link that uh, we can go and get some more information and maybe read uh, artificial intelligence in orthopedics, uh, read more about that machine learning, natural language processing, and deep learning as it was presented at this year's uh, meeting? Well, there, there, you can go to, again, there are several sources. You could go to the Academy website. You could also go to uh, the Mass General website. Uh, we, we have a site there. And then, as I said, soar-ai.com has our algorithms on there, and there are links as well. And uh, I understand that um, is there a place that we can go and learn more about uh, your background and some of the things that you're doing as well? Uh, if you go to the uh, Massachusetts General uh, website, um, we, we, I do have a, a lab site there as well. There, there's lots of information. Sorg, S-O-R-G dash A-I dot com. All right, uh, Dr. Schwab, I, I thank you so much for joining us here on Health Professional Radio tonight. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed it. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Dr. Joseph Schwab. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Listen in, download it SoundCloud, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.